We are I. What an experience and where do I start this one? Man, this is uh this is a ball of wax, this podcast, because this podcast is gonna be uh, a brief overview and an analysis of you know like this two hundred and seventy three kilometer trail that I set out to pilgrimage last week. Or yeah, it was last week now actually. Um this was for my fortieth birthday and you know, for thirty I ran the West Coast Trail and for twenty I can't remember what I did, but it was something significant, you know, nothing super. Oh, the bodybuilding shows. That's what it was. Sorry. My apologies. The bodybuilding shows. It's kind of what started all this off, you know, in my twenties and, or when I was 20 and escalated to 30 and 40 and have these goals for 50 and 60 and 70. And so let's get down to the nitty gritty, like what happened and why. So this adventure started off obviously you know, months and years before with accumulating this idea of like, what am I going to do? And, you know, I knew that I did this West Coast Trail, you know, for 30. And, you know, I wanted to do the Pacific Crest Trail that goes from Tijuana, Mexico to Manning Park, BC for 40. You know, but around like 36, 37, 38, I realized, you know, there's just a lot going on in life. And my kids are too young. You know, it's not a smart decision to take like three months out to do this trail. You know, like the, the smarter decision here is going to be, you know, find something a little bit shorter, something I can do in a weekend, you know, or maybe like three days. So just let me try to find like the equivalent to the West Coast Trail on the East Coast. And there is an East Coast Trail, but it's nothing like what the West Coast Trail is. It's more just these kind of markers and milestones. It's really flat. It was kind of boring. It was, you know, like there's no rich history. There wasn't the history that this is the... This is the route that shipwreck victims and their captains and crews, you know, took when they're, you know, crashing into the rocks just off, you know, BC's coastline. And this is how they got, you know, down to Victoria. This is how they got down to some of these coastal communities from their shipwrecks. Like, there's a lot of rich history behind the West Coast Trail. And there wasn't with the East Coast Trail. So then I find in Prince Edward Island, there's the Confederation Trail. And the Confederation Trail is a, a trail that goes from the north part to the southernmost part of Prince Edward Island across the entire island, 273 kilometers. And I'm like, well, this is, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Something that's longer, you know, something that's on the east coast, you know, something that has some history behind it because, you know, the Confederation Trail, you know, Prince Edward Island is the birthplace of Confederation in Canada. I don't know how many people know that, but, um, not only that is this is where the rail line that connected, you know, all of these communities, all these little tiny villages in Prince Edward Island and connected them all together in this land that birthed Confederation and the concepts of Confederation Canada. And it's, you know, nationally recognized as that. It's a lot of rich history. So I'm like, huh, this is, this is more up my alley. This is more what I'm thinking. Like I, I know there's the length. I know there's not the scenery. I know there's not, you know, it's not going to be visually as strong, you know, but hey, let's do it. So for months before, you know, I deploy the same strategy. I'm just, I'm not going to run. I'm not going to spend a lot of time running. I'm going to spend a lot of time hardening the mind because the mind is what needs to be strong here. Because to be able to do something that's multi-day and in the hundreds of kilometers, it's like, yes, the body is going to break down. Yes, but the mind needs to be strong. Because the mind is what's going to push you through. So, okay, let's speed this up a little bit and let's, you know, get to the part where this journey starts. You know, so I travel to Calgary on a, on a Friday mid afternoon. You know, I'm in Calgary all weekend. I come back on, you know, Monday mid afternoon. I work the rest of the day. It's been a Canada day long weekend celebrations. It's been, you know, Outside in the heat, it's been up, it's been down, it's been left, it's been right, it's just been crazy busy. Get back Monday afternoon, work the rest of the day. 
stop work around nine o'clock at night, leaving the next day to go to Prince Edward Island. Flight departs at 8.30 in the morning. Get up, have a meeting from five to six, and then head to the airport after that. Get to the airport with lots of time. Feeling a little bag, but you know, it's it's okay. Because you know what? When you get to Prince Edward Island, you know what I mean? To get there, you know, arrive there at, you know, a decent time, you know, kind of, you know, later afternoon because of the four hour time change. That's great. You know, thinking in my mind, you know, this gives me all this extra time. It gives me a real good, you know, three day buffer to be able to get this done. So I'm like, okay, great. This is awesome. So get to the airport and 7.30 rolls around, 7.40, plane starts to board. You know, they let us know there's going to be lots of extra space on the plane. I'm like, this is great because, you know, I got next to no sleep the night before. I'm big from traveling the last four days. This is awesome. I actually can sleep the majority of the way. I can find three seats to lay me all out, which I did once we got on the plane. You know, laying there just relaxing. We start to taxi out to the out to the runway. We stop short on the, the curtain, the apron, the skirt, the tarmac, the area of asphalt that's right around where the, the gate is. And the pilot comes on and says, well, folks, you know, we have a little bit of a problem here. You know, our, our altimeter doesn't work. So we're just going to sit here. We're going to pull back into the gate. We're going to sit here. We're going to shut the entire airplane down. We're going to reset the system and we're going to hope the computer comes back online. We're going to do just a quick reset. I'm like, okay. So this is like your router where you pull out all the cords, you know, you wait your 10, 15 seconds, you plug them back in and for some fucking stupid reason, it works when it stopped working. It's like, thank you, technology. So like, okay. So they do this. This whole process takes about, you know, a half an hour. They fire the plane back up. Captain comes back on. Great news, we're about to depart. Great, we start pulling out. We start taxiing to the runway. Captain comes back on. You know what, folks? I'm sorry to tell you. The altimeter, it's not working again. Explains what the altimeter is and its function and why it's necessary and why it might not necessarily be necessary for our flight, but why it's just necessary in general. And it's like, okay. So then they pull back into the gate and the captain's like, we're going to do this reset one more time. And he's like, I'm optimistic. I feel like this is going to work. Sorry, folks, it's going to take about another half an hour. So, you know, we're almost at this point in time between an hour and a half and two hours delayed. So it's like, okay. So he shuts it down. Shuts the whole plane off. You can tell the lights go off. The air goes off. It's hot as fuck on this plane now because for all those of you that travel and know that it's not really until they get to the runway for whatever reason that, you know, like the, the powerful air starts coming out of the little ducts that are in each sea. It's just this really slow trickle of air. So it gets really muggy, really stuffy in these airplanes, especially when we're on one of the airplanes where there's nine seats across, you know, even though that most of the plane isn't full. So he shuts it all down. He starts back up and he's like, you know what, folks? It looks like that we're going to have to do a computer swap. I've already called maintenance. They already know what's going on. They have the parts. They're going to come in and they're going to quickly swap them, swap them out for us. It's like, shouldn't take more than 20, 30 minutes. So there's a sneaky feeling in me. I'm like, how in the fuck with something as critical as an altimeter? How does that take only 20 or 30 minutes to be able to change in real time on an airplane? I'm like, this is interesting. So I'm like, okay. So we sit there and, you know, about an hour goes by and, you know, we're on this plane for, you know, almost three hours now. Back and forth, back and forth. The captain comes back on. He's like, actually, we're not going to be able to, uh, to swap out the computer in that amount of time. We're going to get everybody to get off the plane. We have a two hour delay now. We have a two hour delay. So everybody pop off. Like, okay. So we get off and it's just like, the frustration of being in an airport where you chronically just feel like people are being dishonest about things being on time or, you know, anything along those lines. It's like, just tell us the truth. You know, we all knew that it wasn't going to just be this quick fix. Why not just let us know? 
So we're out there and we walk back around. And I know from my experience flying that, you know, we get these, you know, food vouchers when there's these delays and stuff. So I circle back around and, you know, grab us our, you know, food vouchers, $10 each, which the funny part is because even like a chocolate bar literally is like $6.50 in the airport. So what fucking meal are you going to buy for $10? And, but the funny thing is behind this is that they don't actually say to anybody that they get these. You don't say anything to anybody. So unless if you know, you never got them. So speed this up a little bit, about two and a half hours goes by and you know, three hours goes by. And all of a sudden there's an announcement. You know, sorry folks, your plane's been canceled because the crew has now timed out. So even if we do fix this problem in the next half an hour, half an hour or hour, your crew can no longer fly. So we're canceling this flight until 1030 at night. So go out, back out through security, grab your bags, check in for your next flight, get new bag tags for your ta- your bags, go back through security and hang out and wait. And we'll give you some more food vouchers. So you have to think like now, you know, we're at the airport from 645 in the morning and your plane's not going to leave until 1030 at night. If it's going to leave because you've had nothing but delays. And for all, everybody who knows, the airports only have really typically shitty food. There's nothing really great to eat in an airport. So all in all, we go through this process and it takes about an hour and a half for the bags to get unloaded off this plane, finally, you know, get in. Then there's the complications of, you know, everybody trying to find their new flights, get these bags re-tagged and the staff at the front being inundated, you know, with a few hundred people that were just on this flight that just got off on top of all the other people who would normally be at the airport. So all in all, we walk away with about $40 in total with the original 10 of, you know, meal vouchers, which is literally just one meal. But in my mind, I'm thinking now, I'm like, this is, I don't like this. I don't like the way that this is, this is starting to formulate, you know, because for one, it's like, this puts me at least because once I land, there's still a significant drive component to all of this. But I'm like, this alone, just this flight delay, just the flight, puts me 16 hours behind where I want to be in in a run that I know or a pilgrimage. I don't like to call it a run because I know I'm not going to run it the whole time. But a pilgrimage I know is going to take me days to be able to complete. And I'm like, this isn't isn't what I want it to be. And this is my main purpose going here. I should just walk away from the whole thing. So I'm like, this is early enough in the day now. Like this is, you know, like two, three o'clock in the afternoon. I'm like, I should just walk away from this right now. Like this isn't, this isn't worth it. This is Tuesday, two, three o'clock in the afternoon. I really only have until Saturday afternoon to be able to, to complete this. So what happens with the next amount of delays that may happen from here to there. So I'm like, okay. So the, the thoughts just raining in my mind that just something doesn't feel right about this, you know, but I go along with it anyway, you know, thinking like, you know what, this is just a part of the test of this. This is just a part of the, the mental test. I've been training mentally and forcing myself mentally and emotionally through this, even though that there's this nagging, thing in the back of my mind and my heart and my soul that says, you know what, Blake, like this, you shouldn't do like, this is not like, you know, going into this, you know, after four days of travel, you're 16 hours behind and you don't even know when these delays are going to stop and you're going to run, you're going to pilgrimage 273 kilometers across an island. It's like, this isn't, you're not setting yourself up for success, but I'm in my mind. I'm like, you know what? No, it's easy to allow that coward to creep in. It's easy to allow that bitch to creep in. It's easy to allow, you know, that, that weakness that, that says, don't do it. Finding all the reasons not to do it. So I'm like, fuck that. 
But it's nagging hard. It's nagging in a way where it's not just like letting that inner bitch creep in. It's nagging in a way where I feel like I'm making a poor decision. And it's like, no, like this is different because you have the mental fortitude. You have the physical strength to be able to overcome this. But this is big. Like this is, this is a very big thing that you're about to do is nagging at you. Like you're not setting yourself up for success here. You're eating pepperoni sticks now and the beef jerky that you planned on eating on your run, you're eating all of that now. You're eating the shitty fucking Grimm's pepperoni and, you know, dark chocolate you're finding in airports. There's nothing for you to eat. You, you end up finding this, you know, small steak to be able to eat, but it's, it's nothing compares to the calories that you need to be able to go do this. Never mind, you're sitting in an airport all, all day, which crushes the body. You've been in on, on and off airplane sitting there for hours already and now you have a red eye flight which throws off not only your whole timing but you know you're not going to fucking sleep on this plane because you don't even board this time until 10 30 at night which is 2 30 in the morning local time in halifax where you're going to land so do the math here and the flight's five hours. So it's like, okay. Okay. It's that nagging side of me that's just like, you know what, fuck Blake, just go home. Cancel this flight, get a refund, regroup and go in like a month from now or two months from now. There's a lot of nice weather left. There's a lot of there's a lot of daylight left in this year. Let's go another time. You know, but I have to put all that aside. And it's like whether I want to or not, I have to put all that aside. So the hours and hours and hours just keep building up and the body's not feeling good and you're trying to be comfortable. It's like, fuck, should I sleep some now? Should I not? You know, the body's getting antsy. The body's getting restless. The back's getting tight from sitting in the airport. I'm doing squats. I'm doing lunges. I'm doing all these things to keep myself occupied. But at the end of the day, you're still in the fucking airport for 16 hours. Like, what are you going to do? Like, this worst case scenario before you do something like this. I'm just trying to say calm because I don't want the emotions to get out of control to you. Even though there's that underlying part of me that's just annoyed, super annoyed and frustrated. So the next plane comes around and they board us. And, you know, now we're on a plane that's half the size and it's packed to the gills. And it's like, okay, you know, we get up and it's like, get in the air and we get going. And it's like, you know, how am I going to sleep? Like, how are you really going to sleep in this moment right now? Because, you know, you're on an airplane, you're sandwiched in before you had this opportunity to be able to lay down amongst all three seats on your own, get some nap. Now you're crammed in amongst this seat with like two other people and you're not going to, you're not going to get comfortable. This is not the time for that. There's no comfort now. And, you know, never mind on this plane, for whatever reason, the flight crew, that was a good idea to leave the fucking lights on, which, you know, normally they always turn the lights off in the evening flights and the overnight flights so people can get some sleep, but they didn't. So they're about 45 minutes of sleep, maybe an hour of sleep. And we're coming towards tr to coming into and by Toronto. You know, we're about an hour outside of Toronto and this old man at the front of the plane starts getting a little unruly, starts yelling and shit and i'm just like huh this is fucking super strange you know so i go to the bathroom and i'm you know standing there and i hear in the bathroom next door this guy yelling i'm like what the fuck so i get out and i see the old guy at the very front of the plane or towards the front of the plane and i still hear this other guy yelling and i go to the stewardess i'm like there's some guy yelling here they're like oh we thought we heard something too so after about five minutes, like I tried to help these two stewardess, these two females get this guy. And I say female, because obviously it's awkward for them to try to get a man at the bathroom. But every time that we try to ask him if he needs help, he doesn't understand English. And he keeps kicking the door closed. Which understandable, you don't want fucking strangers coming in the bathroom. But you're sitting in here yelling and nobody knows what's wrong. So I go back to my seat and it becomes a little bit of a scene. And about half an hour later, the... Pilot comes on and says, we need to divert and make an emergency landing into Toronto. Please put all your phones away. Please stay in your seats. 
there'll be some people boarding the plane. There'll be some people getting off the plane. So instead of going to Halifax, we divert to Toronto, which again extends this yet a little bit more. The police board the airplane once we land. The police get these two gentlemen off and it was a little, uh, it was a little interesting. They well, didn't get too rowdy, but there was this underlying amount of tension. You could see these police officers at any time were like, I hope this doesn't fucking get crazy because these guys are like 80s and they were in their 80s. You know, and we're all sitting there, fuck, like not another delay. And they're like, oh, we're going to be back up in there in about 20 minutes. And again, fuck this 20 minute bullshit. We all know that this is a fucking lie. We all know that this is just absolutely unreasonable. So they get the guy off the plane and about 15 minutes later, the pilot comes back on and he says, I'm sorry, folks, but we've timed out. You guys are going to have to wait till another crew gets here to be able to take off. Um, but we're not going to be able to fly you to Halifax today. Should be only about another 15 minutes to half an hour. And then your next crew will be here. So over an hour later, we're finally getting graced with our, our new flight crew that's going to take us the, the next hour, hour and a half of our journey to Halifax. So you can imagine now the this like 14 hour delay to being in the airport for 16 hours. Now we've landed in a completely different city. Now you're even more fucking thrown off because, you know, you've had this extra stop in Toronto and this whole thing, the length that it took just getting the guy off the plane, we could have landed, literally landed in Halifax. And they could have dealt with it there. But nope, you know, airport regulations, they got to land as quickly as possible if they need to get unruly passengers off the plane. Well, fuck. So let's add another two hours of a delay. So... Now we're up to an actual 16 and something hour delay behind. And the annoying part about this is, because obviously it's like you've paid for this rental car that you now, you don't need. You've paid for like lodging that you don't need. Like I've been starving, you know, for three quarters of a day now. I've had no sleep the entire night before. Like I said, 45 minutes, like at best, I may have fallen asleep for another 10, 15 minutes from Toronto to Halifax, like at best. So we get off the plane, we grab our car, no problems there, after waiting about 45 minutes for the, our bags. Pop the stuff in the car, drive down the road, so bagged, just so bagged, having no idea how I'm even going to contemplate starting this, this run which I should have started that morning. Now it's mid afternoon. Like you're talking like actual noon. I'm like, fuck. So we decided to stop at Tim Hortons just to be able to get a couple of espressos. Cause again, I've had no coffee, no nothing. Just trying to fuel myself on nutrients like greens and noon tabs. And, you know, again, like a little bit of like beef jerky and chocolate, but like that ended hours and hours ago. So this, you get to that point where you're driving and you can just feel that hotness of the the heat exhaustion coming over you. And you're just, you're absolutely bagged. And it's a three hour drive to be able to even get to where you're, you're going, your destination across this bridge. Then it's another hour and a half drive to the beginning of the trail. So you're sitting there and what's going to lull you into even more of a slumber, but a four hour drive. Beautiful as the countryside may be, nothing like what I thought Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island would look like. You know, beautiful scenery, beautiful trees, beautiful coastline, beautiful everything, but just not what I thought it was going to be. So it was, it was great visually. It's really cool going over the, the Confederation Bridge. But the exhaustion is just creeping in. You can feel it in the, the mind and the body. The hunger is creeping. You're hungry. You just want something to eat, like food. But you know, you can't now, like you can't eat a big meal now because you're about to go start this run. Almost a day later, a day into it, thinking in my head like I should be a like 150 kilometers in or more by now, between 150 and 200 kilometers, I should already have had that done. And I'm not even close to the start yet. 
So food is on the mind. Tiredness is on the mind. Exhaustion is on the mind. So driving there and just knowing that at the end of the day, like I got to find some food because now all the food that I brought to eat while I'm doing the first leg of this to get me through the first kind of 12 to 16, 24 hours is all gone. The only thing I have left now is, you know, a few Snickers bars that, you know, I brought because it's like this little treat that I like when I'm hiking. Other than that, I have no food, no food at all. So I eat it all, had to. And it wasn't the type of food that you want to eat to fuel you up for an event like this before. Like I said, I could feel the, the hunger pains in the stomach. So we finally, you know, get to this little town of Tignish, you know, after four hours of driving. And you find this little restaurant that sells these, you know, lobster roll sandwiches, which you wanted to take. This was the goal is to find a few of these lobster roll sandwiches, throw them in your pack and nibble on these as you go to be able to get some calories in you. And then you get them and they're these tiny, tiny little hot dog buns. And you, after doing a quick little bit of research, you find that this is like traditional, but like in your mind, you were thinking you'd have like these, you know, lobster roll sandwiches on these medium sized baguettes. Nice French baguette, you know, with lots of mayonnaise, lots of calories. So I was like, fuck, here we go. Like these two little things are going to do absolutely nothing for me, but they're better than nothing. It's like 4.30 in the afternoon and staying at kilometer zero of this trail. You know, after almost a full 24 hours of delay. Having no sleep for days. And having... No food in the belly. You strap your shoes on, you get your pack, and you hit start on your watch. So I'm going to break this into two parts. This is part one. Part one was the journey. Part two will be the trail. Maybe a part three will break down and analyze what all this meant to me. So hopefully you survive listening through part one, and it excites you enough to listen to part two. 